It is good to see you in the Lord's house. Thank you for being here. And uh, Pastor Steve, thank you for sharing your pulpit. It's an honor. Uh, I honor you and, and Sheila. What a blessing you are. Bishop, good to see you. It's an honor. Uh, Perry, good to see you. Perry always went, I went on a lot of prayer retreats with Pastor Steve and Perry. And Perry would always say, Pastor, I'm praying for you. He said, give me something to pray for. I'm going to walk the beach and pray for you. Amen. I remember that. Praise the Lord. But it's good. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Let me get right to it because i got something to share with you that I think is very important for us all. This little girl came up to me one day in church, and she said, Pastor, why did the chicken cross the road? And I thought, I know that one. That's easy. Get to the other side. She said, nope, to prove to the possum it could be done. That's us. That's who we are. We are the ones that prove it can be done. We are the one. see, we're the ones that know that serving God is the best way. We can prove that you can live a victorious life. We can prove that you can overcome. That's who we are. Hallelujah. I know there's a lot going on in the world. I know everything's happening around you. I, I know you see it. I know we, we've been through it, and we see it. But we also see the Lord, and he's high and lifted up. Amen? He's above all this. He transcends all this, and, uh, and he's still on the throne. That's why we celebrate. That's why we come here and celebrate. There was a... There was a atheist professor that was teaching his class one day, and he, he decided to challenge God, and he told his students, he said, there's no such thing as God. He said, in fact, I'm going to challenge him right now so that you will know that. So he stood up on the platform in his class, and he said, I'm going to give God 15 minutes to knock me off this platform. And so he stood there, and he taunted the space of the Christians in the class. He messed with them and messed with them. He said, 10 minutes, God, 10 more minutes is all you got. If you're God, knock me off this platform. If you can't do it, then you, there's no God. Five minutes, more minutes went by. There was this 350-pound linebacker walking by the door about that time, and he heard what the man said. So in a full speed, he runs in, knocks that man off the platform over into the metal chairs. The guy got up, shook his head, and he said, what'd you do that for? He said, God was busy. He sent me. How many knows God's not too busy, but he does use us? He wants to use us. So not just in the here and now. I really want you to hear this, but in the future. What you're doing today is going to affect the future. I want to show you how. You ready for the word? Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles if you have them. I have a lot of scripture, but I'm just going to share these two, and Brittany's going to put them up in a moment, and, and, but I want you to turn in your Bible to Psalms 89, if you would. If you don't have your Bible, it, it's up there, I'm sure. It's going to be. Amen. Psalms chapter 89. Praise the Lord. If you got to say glory, I want you to stand with me in reverence to the Lord's word. How many knows God's word solid? No other word's going to trump this. This trumps all other words. Amen. Psalms 89, we're going to begin reading with verse 1. Now, if you're reading... The translation that's there, the, the one translation says, a maskil, a maskil of Ethan the Ezraite. Your Bible may say nothing there. Uh, one Bible says, a contemplation of Ethan, an act of looking at something for a long time. We need to look at this. So he says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Hallelujah. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. I want you, somebody say mercy. mercy. 
Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. I want you to know something there. In verse 3, he says, I have sworn to David. In verse 20, he says, I have anointed my servant, David. Now, go down to verse 28. Go down to verse 28. I want you to notice what he says. I can't, I'm not going to read this whole thing for the sake of time, but he says, my mercy will I keep for him forevermore. My covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever. His throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him. Hallelujah. Nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Glory to God. You see what he's saying there? He says, if his kids mess up, I'm going to spank them. Aren't you? Hallelujah. The NIV says in verse 33, he says, but I will not take my love from him or betray my faithfulness. If you're reading in King James, it says, suffer my faithfulness to fail. Verse 34, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn it by my holiness, that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. The New Living Translation there in verse 35 says, Once I have sworn an oath to David, and in my holiness, I cannot lie. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word. We need it. We need it, Lord. It's an encouragement to us. We need this time. Thank you for the time of worship. Thank you for the time of prayer. And thank you for the time that you're going to speak to us through your word. Thank you for the anointing because without you, I can't do anything. I need you, Lord. Let me be a mouthpiece today and help us all, every one of us, to absorb in our hearts what you're saying through your word. We ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. High five your neighbor and tell him it's good to be in the Lord's, good to see him in the Lord's house. How many knows that a part of God's promise to David will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ, whose kingdom will never end? But also a part of this covenant that God made with David was fulfilled in David's children. How many knows that God answers your prayers even after you're dead? Hello. I want to talk to you about storing up a godly heritage. Storing up a godly heritage. Now, if you're if you're if you're a grandparent here or you're a parent here, I know you pray for your children, and I know you pray for your grandchildren. If you're thinking about getting married, you say we're planning a family. You really need to be praying, amen. I pray more for my grandchildren than I do anybody because I know what they're going to have to face should Jesus tarry. Ethan in Psalms 89:1 says this about the Lord. I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. One translation says the faithfulness of God from generation to generation. Now, why did Ethan say that? Because God had made a covenant with David that didn't just affect David, but affected generations after him. David had laid the groundwork, you remember, for future blessings. He had already laid the ground. For example, you remember when Solomon was building the temple? When Solomon was building the temple, he had all these things to build it with, but you know where they came from? David had laid them up. He built it off what David had stored up for him to build it on. The Bible says David left him 1,017,000 talents of silver. He left him 108,000 talents of gold to build the temple on. Can you imagine how much easier Solomon's job was? How much easier his assignment was because of what David had laid up for him. Because David, his father, laid up this amazing wealth for Solomon to use. Hundreds and thousands of millions of dollars. And they say in today's time, in today's currency, 
It would have been about $5 billion. And most of it was paid for because David had laid up and stored up for the next generation. But now listen, as important, as, as great as what he laid up financially, he laid up an even greater spiritual heritage. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Samuel says in 1 Samuel 13, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. You go over to the New Testament and Apostle Paul in Acts 13, 23 says, I have found, he quotes, he quotes God. He says, I have found David, a man after my own heart, who will do my will. Hallelujah. How many knows that God The Bible says that God made a covenant with him, and God says, I make this covenant of sure mercies with you. There will never come a time, David, when I will not be in covenant with you. And your seed and your seed seed generation after generation. God said, David, because you've honored me, I will honor your family for generations to come. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I think, I think Scripture teaches us that our lives are even either stepping stones or stumbling blocks in the lives of our children. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I want to be a stepping stone. Now, I mean, you know, we can see lifestyles. We can see lifestyles passed down from generation to generation. You know that, and I know that. This little girl one day was watching her mama cook, and her mama cut the end off of the roast, and then she put it in her pan. And she said, Mama, why do you cut the end off the roast? She says, I don't know. She said, my mom always did it. She said, you'll have to ask your grandma. So he goes to grandma and he says, grandma, why do you cut the end off your roast? She said, I don't know. She said, my mom always did it. You have to ask your great grandmother. So he goes to great grandmother and he says, great grandmother, why do you cut the end off your roast? She said, because my pan's too short. Listen to me. Our descendants will generally do what we do for no apparent reason. But just because we did it, they'll do it. I remember when I used to have child dedications in my church, and we would we would bring them up front. You know how, and you you always pick the baby up, stuff like that. But I spent more time on the parents than I did the child. When I would have the elders lay hands on somebody, they'd lay hands on the parent. Because I told the parent, they're going to do what you do. So if you ain't got it together, send them to Sunday school is not going to work. Come on now, amen. When a man doesn't have time for God, his children's not going to have time for God. Don't expect your children to be something that you're not. And so I would always lay hands on the parent. When a man doesn't think church is important, it won't take long. The children won't think church is important. They'll have fun in Sunday school for a while, but after a while, they're going to do what daddy does. I remember me and my wife, we were walking up to our neighbors one day, and uh, he was out there weeding, and we decided to stop. And long story short, we got talking about the Lord with him. He began to weep. And he said, uh, And we led him to the Lord, and he said, you know, I never went to church. He said, my mama used to go to the church, but my daddy stayed home and worked around the house. And he said, I I guess a man ought to be like his dad. That's powerful. They're going to do what we do. The Scripture shows a distinct difference between those who reject God and those who serve him. Exodus 25 says, those who reject me, I will punish the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. But of those who love me and keep my commandments, I will show mercy to a thousand generation. What did he say in Psalms 89? Mercy shall be stored up. I think the scripture lets us know that we can lay up or store up mercy for generations coming after us. Amen. Now, I know, preacher, they got to make a conscious decision. They have to do that for themselves. I know that. But I want them to get to heaven because of me, not in spite of me. Hallelujah. I want to be that example. God said, David, because you've honored me, because you've had a passion for the things of God and the house of God, because of this, I'm going to bless your house for generations to come. 2 Samuel 3 and 1 says, the house of David 
grew stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker. We're supposed to be building houses that get stronger with every generation. Hello. We're not supposed to be the strong. We're supposed to be building houses that get stronger with every generation. 2 Corinthians 12, 14 says, Children ought not to be laying up for the parents, but parents ought to be laying up for the children. What's he saying? And I know we automatically think material things, and that's good, and we should. But I think it's so much more than that. I think it's so much more. I think he's also saying children shouldn't have to seek after God for a spiritual inheritance for their parents. Children shouldn't be in here praying for their parents. That's backwards. That we got to back. Children shouldn't have to evangelize their own parents. We're not supposed to be crying and agonizing over their parents' spiritual welfare. God wants us parents to be in such a covenant with him that we lay up spiritual blessings for our children. Every time you're on your knees, every time you're obedient to the voice of God, every time you're in church, you're storing up mercy. You're storing up blessings. Hallelujah. God's honoring you. One Sunday morning, we woke up, and we were getting ready for church, and my son always was the last minute. So I woke up, and I said, son, get up. He looked at me. He said, Dad, do we have to go to church every Sunday? And I just said, boy, get up. You know, but I could have stood there for a while. I didn't, I didn't say much. I just said, get on out of that bed. But I could have said, well, I should go since I'm the pastor. I probably ought to go. But knowing what I know now, knowing what I know now, I would have said, this is for you. You don't know it, but this is for you. Every time you get up out of bed, every time you read your Bible, every time you serve God, every time you make God's will a priority in your life, he said, I've got a man after my own heart that will do whatever I tell him, that will do the will of God. Every time you do that, this is for you. This is for you, you tell your children. Hallelujah. They don't know it. They don't understand, but you understand. Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Not just cars and houses. And that's all fine. But Jesus said, A man's life consisteth not of the things which he possesseth. It's the spiritual things. And I think, I, I just believe it also teaches that a good man will leave or store up a spiritual heritage for his children and his children's children. God said in Psalms 89, this is what a spiritual heritage looks like. Can I show you? This is what it looks like. He said in Psalms 89, he said, my covenant, David, will never fail. I'm going to watch over your family. If your children forsake my laws, if your children get rebellious, if your children don't walk according to my statute, I'm going to visit their transgressions with a rod and their iniquities with stripes. NIV says that there, I will punish their sins with the rod. Now, when you commit your life to Christ and you sell out to God, he not only makes earthly and kingdom provisions for you, but he sets up a covenant account with your whole family. I believe that with all my heart. God said, David, I'm not going to treat your kids like everybody else. I'm not going to treat your kids like everybody else's kids. Hallelujah. See, other people's children can do whatever they want. They don't have any spiritual roots. They're not connected. I, I, I'm, I'm a, they can do anything. I'm not going to deal with them like I deal with the children of the righteous. Hello. Because you're in covenant with me, when your kids mess up, I'm going to get the rod out. I'm going to whip them. I'm going to put some stripes on them. How many, sometime, how many know sometimes God has to whip us to get us? Isn't that what John said? Otherwise, we're illegitimate children if he doesn't. How many know sometimes God's got to whip us to get us back to where he wants us? Now, mama, daddy, grandma, grandpa, when this happens, stay out of it. Stay out of it. Don't say, oh, God. And you go down to the women's service and say, you got to pray. My little, my little junior, he's going through some hard times. God might be whipping him. Come on now. God might, my, God might be putting some stripes on him. You remember when you took him to kindergarten for the first time? And you turned around three or four times after you let him go, and you turned around and said, are you okay? Let the teacher have him. And what did they tell you? Let us have them. We'll take care of them. Trust us. Trust us. Somebody in here needs to turn over and go back to sleep. 
Come on now, somebody needs to trust the covenant. Somebody that's in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ who served God and loved God and keep his commandments. Somebody needs to just turn over and go back to sleep and say, Lord, I trust you. I'm putting them in you. I'm going to trust you because you'll wear yourself out. Uh, You have to believe in him. Hallelujah. David had to believe in him. David never got to see the future of his children. Never, David never got to see everything that was going to happen in the future. He had to trust the covenant. It's good to know that we can be in covenant with God. And when I'm dead and gone and long time buried, God's going to look over my, watch over my family. God said, David, I'm going to keep an eye on your family. They may get into trouble. They may stray. They may struggle. They may run with the wrong crowd for a while. But after I get done whipping them, after I get done correcting them, I'm going to steer them back to the God of their father. I'm going to bring them back. You may not see it, but God's going to bring it back. Hallelujah. And one day they're going to walk into an old altar somewhere and give their life to Jesus Christ. You may not even be around, uh, but God's going to bring them into a church one day. And they're going to say, I don't even know why I'm going to church, but I'm going to go into this church and kneel down at this altar, and I feel like I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. That's called covenant. Amen. And I, if I don't serve God for any other reason, I'm going to serve him for my children. Hallelujah. Because God set up a covenant with them, sets up a covenant with a man or woman who serves him. And that covenant blesses their families from generation to generation. Psalms 1856, if you're writing it down. Great deliverance, saith the Lord, to him and his children. Great deliverance is coming for him and his children. Psalms 103, 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, the New Testament says this in Luke 150, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. The IV says it like this, his mercy extends. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. I'm a third generation child of God. Hallelujah. My children are a fourth generation children of God. My grandchildren are fifth generation children of God. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. I want to serve God with such passion that mercy will be extended to my children. Yes, they have to make a conscious decision for Christ themselves. They do. But I want my zeal for God to extend mercy, to help them. I want my faith in God, my tenacity. Hallelujah. I remember reading in 2 Timothy 2 and 1, you remember Paul was teaching his young apprentice, Timothy? And Paul said, Timothy, when I see the sincere faith that is in you, it first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and then in your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded it's in you also. What was God saying? It didn't start with you, and it's not about to end with you. Paul said, when I look at you, Timothy, I see three generations ago a granny that made a covenant with God and it jumped out of granny into your mama and then it jumped out of you or your mama into you and it just keeps going. That's why he said, don't be weary in well-doing for you shall reap in due season if you faint not. Keep serving God. Hallelujah. We're not crazy for coming to church. We're not crazy for loving God. We're not crazy for reading the Bible. You're not crazy for paying your tithes and laying up treasure. You understand, we're not crazy for honoring God in every area of our lives, every area. But we, listen, hallelujah, amen? But here it is. We must absolutely, we must absolutely grasp the revelation that what we're doing is not just about the here and now. You're not just serving God for yourself, and then one day I'm going to be in glory. What you're doing right now in your covenant relationship with God, it's affecting generations to come. Psalms 89 says, mercy shall be built up. Can I help you see this? Can I help you see this just for a minute? Second Chronicles chapter 6, David died. Eleven years later, 
David's, de- David's dead. Eleven years after his death, Solomon, his son, is dedicating the temple. They've already built this temple. I mean, it took 11 years to build. 10,000 men cut the cedars of Lebanon for the temple. 150,000 men, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, worked on this temple for 11 years. And when the day came to dedicate the temple, over 3 million people were there. 4,000 ushers, 4,000 in the orchestra. When Solomon stood up to pray the dedicatorial prayer, to dedicate this house of God, he ended the prayer with these words. Listen to me. O Lord, do not reject your anointed one. Do not reject. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. Don't let these prayers, when you read one translation, fall on a deaf ear. Lord, re- receive my pr- answer my prayers. I'm praying for a blessing on your house. Answer my prayers. But watch what he said. Do not reject your anointed one. Remember the mercies of David, thy servant. It's 11 years later, and Solomon is saying, Lord, receive me because of what you promised David. Receive me because of what. And the NIV says, remember the love you promised David, Lord. Hallelujah. Remember the mercies stored up for David. When he finished saying that, fire came down, the Bible says, from heaven and the glory filled the place, and the priest couldn't even go inside for a little bit. The mercies were being released on another generation 11 years after David's death. Don't underestimate, don't ever underestimate a praying mom or a praying dad or a praying grandparents. Granddad, you may think your prayers is hitting the ceiling. You may think, boy, that grandson, that granddaughter, I, I, but mercy is being stored up. You keep serving God. It will be released on somebody when they need it most. 1 Kings 11, David's been dead for 23 years. Solomon has fallen in love with strange women. He's now building idols to strange gods. And the Lord looks down in 1 Kings 11 and he says, I should rend the kingdom from you. I ought to tear it right out of your hands. If you got what you deserved, I'd pull the carpet right out from under you. But I will not do it for David thy father's sake. You're getting away with it this time, big boy, because of your daddy. Hallelujah. The boy's living rebellious. He's living wild. He's drinking. He's going to parties. That's on our terms, you understand. His heart has turned to other gods. God said the reason judgment doesn't come right now is because you had a praying father. And 23 years ago, I was in covenant with him. You've run out of chances, but I'm going to give you some extended time because he stored up grace and mercy for you. Is anybody getting this? Are you getting this? 1 Kings 15, David's been dead 57 years. 57 years. His great-grandson, Jeroboam, is on the throne. He's wicked. He's burning children to the fire god. 1 Kings 15, God said, I should bring judgment on you and Jerusalem. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did God give light in Jerusalem. You know what he's saying? The lamp was burning in a wicked generation, not because the boy had the goods, but because a great-granddaddy made a covenant with God and did, God, did what God asked him to do, served him, a man after his own heart, 57 years ago. Because of that, there was still a light, the Bible says, burning in Israel because of what David did. Hallelujah. Remember what God said in Exodus, to them that love me, I will show mercy for a thousand generations. Glory to God. Can you handle any more? Can you take some more? 2 Kings 19. David's been dead 305 years. 305 years. Hezekiah, the great, 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 great grandson of David is surrounded by the Assyrian army. 2 Kings 19 says, for my own sake, this is what the Lord says, and my servant David's sake, I'm going to deliver you. 
Now, David's been dead for 305 years. Hezekiah, you didn't even know your great, 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 great granddaddy. But I made a covenant with him. And I'm going to dispatch an angel because of, his, for, because of that covenant. I'm going to send out an angel. 2 Kings 19.35 says, And that night the angel of the Lord went out into the camp of the Assyrians and smote 185,000 men. And when Hezekiah said, when he asked why, the Lord just said, It had nothing to do with you, hot shot. Nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with a covenant that was established in your family over 300 years ago. Hallelujah. Listen, listen, you godly moms and dads and grandparents, there may come a day, a day when your children don't have quite what they need to make it. But because you serve God, because you have a heart for God, because you've stored up mercy, because you're living in a covenant with Christ Jesus, it's going to help carry them through. I'm not talking about salvation. they got to make a decision. But when the enemy would otherwise take them out, uh, what you've stored up in a covenant with God, God's going to remember it. I'm talking about you may have a great-grandson or a grandson, and he's out there running the roads. He's with the wrong crowd, uh, and they might be drinking a little bit, and they're running too fast on the car, and that car flips over several times, uh, and maybe one or two of them lose their life. Uh, but that grandson comes out of there, and he gets to the hospital, and everybody runs down there, and they say, boy, he was lucky. No, he wasn't lucky. God dispatched an angel because of a praying granddaddy, because of a granddaddy that was going to follow God all of his life, and he had a covenant with the Lord. And because of that, God said, I'm sending out an angel that's going to put his arms around that boy. Hallelujah. Thank God, thank God that we can be in covenant. For those who love me, saith the Lord. I will show mercy for a thousand generations. We need the heart of Joshua. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. They're going to see me serving the Lord. My children and children's children are going to watch me serving the Lord. Don't ever stop serving God with your whole heart. Amen. The Bible says in Psalms, the righteous are like the palm tree. Now, we talk about the palm tree and how resilient it is. I'm going to preach a sermon here. How it can bend over in a storm and come right back up. But the word there in the Hebrew means uncompromising. Hello. There's a lot of words for righteous, but that one means the uncompromising righteous. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to stay in covenant with God. That's why. When God begins to enter into a covenant with you through Jesus Christ, when you get free, stay free. Stay free. We need to put on the whole armor of God because you're not just fighting for yourself. You're fighting for your whole house. We're fighting for our whole house, your children and your children's children. And if Jesus tarried, that could go on many generations. I don't want to just know him. I want to pursue him. I want to pursue him. David said, as the deer panteth after the water, so my soul thirsteth after thee. David said, my zeal for God's house confuses my brother. They kind of think I'm crazy. You're not crazy for being in God's house. You're not crazy for serving the Lord. Well, you're a fanatic. Well, a fanatic just means an exciting person. How many is excited about coming to God's house? Are we crazy? No. We're not just fighting for ourselves. Let me land this plane. Listen to this. We go forward in time. We see the Messianic prophet that wrote, talk more about Jesus and Messiah than all the prophet, other prophets put together. Isaiah 51 or 55 and 1 says, Ho, oh, is anybody thirsty? Come you to the waters. Buy wine and milk without price. It's free. So what's he, what's he saying? He's looking forward to Messiah. He's writing about Messiah. 
Because when we see Jesus in his earthly ministries on, in John 7, 37 and 38, Jesus confirms this word. He said, is anybody thirsty? Let him come and drink of the waters of life freely. So Isaiah is looking forward to that time. But watch this. In Isaiah 55 and 3, here's what's going to happen when you drink this water. Here's what's going to happen when you have a covenant relationship with Jesus. Incline your ear and come unto me and hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. Even the sure mercies of David. The NIV says it like this. Come and live, and I will make everlasting covenant to you. The same faithful love. I will give you the same faithful love that I promised David. The New Living Translation says, I will give you all the unfailing love I promised David. The Amplified Bible says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies promised and shown to David. I'm telling you, if you get in covenant with God, if you stay in covenant with God, God's going to show up when you're gone. If Jesus tarries and you leave this world and go into the glory, God's going to show up for your family when you're gone. Even the mercies promised and shown to David. Isaiah 54 and 10 says, if, Even if the mountains be removed, my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessings will never be broken. Psalms 31 19 says, How great is your mercy. Sister Beth used this, this at camp meeting. How great is your mercy you have stored up for those who fear you. Hallelujah. I believe when we serve God with our whole heart and live in covenant with God, I believe when we live right, it gets into our children. It just gets into them. Even if they stray, they may stray a little bit, but God never forgets that covenant you have with Him. They may stray, but they don't fit in quite as good. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're out there, but something just keeps eating at them. Something keeps eating at them. And you may not see it in your lifetime. Even if they go out and party, a voice is going off in their head. I mean, just something, it's just something happening. Even if I die and my children decide never to darken the church for years, my prayers don't die. The covenant I had with God don't die. The mercy I, mercies I laid up don't die. My dad's bones are in the ground, his, but his prayers are still alive in me. He's been gone for 21 years. His lifestyle style still alive in me. God said, I'm going to keep your children in line. I'm going to bring them back. My dad was a quiet man. He had a covenant relationship with God. He had three sons, all preachers. He had a grandson who's a preacher and a great-grandson who's a preacher. Now, not everybody's going to be a preacher. Not everybody's going to be a preacher. But we can have generation after generation children and children's children, a family who serves the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, I want to give you a couple examples. I said I was landing the plane, but you know how long it takes to descend, right? Just keep your butt, don't take your seatbelts off yet. In 1970s, I remember a man named Brother Mac. Brother McDaniel, we called him Brother Mac. Brother Mac had several children, but he come up and he told me, he said, Preacher, I'm praying for my grandchildren and my children. I keep praying for him. He died. His daughter had left the church when he was still alive. She called me one day, said, Pastor, take my name off the row. I'm living in sin. I said, I'm not taking your name off the row because you're coming home. One day you will be home. How many knows it's not our church, it's his? So don't take, her, don't take your name off the row. I'm not taking your name. You'll be back. You'll be, no, I'm not coming back. She had married a man, and I'm not going to tell you everything about him, but uh, she had she'd married a man, and he... Uh, he was a terrible alcoholic, among other things. But actually, he had no. So she stayed away. Ten years after Brother Mac died, the daughter came to church, come back to the Lord. Her husband got saved. He went crazy for the Lord. He absolutely just went nuts for the Lord. 
Now he's about 80 years old, and he's been greeting at the East Doors in our church for about 40 years. <laughs> She's gone on to be with the Lord. Herbie's still there greeting. 25 years after Brother Mac's death, one of his grandson, a police officer, they don't know how it happened. He had a brain bleed, but that stopped him in his tracks. He began to turn to church, never came to church, gave his heart to the Lord. They worried about him all the time. They still worry about him today. He'll go fishing off by himself out in the mountains. They'll say, don't leave. They sent out a search one night. They had everybody run looking for him. When he got back, he stood up in front of the church. He said, would you quit looking for me? He said, for the first time in my life, if I die, I know where I'm going. 25 years later. See, I'm not just serving God for myself. I'm serving him for my whole house. I want to be an example to generations that follow. But even more important, I want that covenant relationship. Because even if they don't follow my example immediately, I know God's got a plan for them because of us serving God. Are you with me? Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, brother. The message today is not just about being an example. It's about leaving a heritage. It's about storing up a covenant of mercy for those coming behind you to be passed down to the next generation. It's about living in such a covenant relationship with God and serving God with your whole heart that we know he's going to watch after our children even after we're gone. You say, preacher, I'm starting today. I realize I need to give my heart to God. I realize I need to get in a covenant relationship with God. Or you might be here and you're in a relationship with God and you say, there's some sin in my life that needs to go because I want to serve God with my whole heart. Remember what God said? I found a man, a man after my own heart that'll do what I ask him. Preacher, I want to do what God asked me. That's my desire. I really need to do. You may be here today. You say, I need to set some priorities. I need to set some priorities. Let me give you just a little sidetrack. This, this is not necessarily part of my sermon, but I want, I want to say it. Dad, your influence is so powerful. You have three times the influence that mom does. Nothing wrong with you, mom. God bless you. Thank you, moms, for bringing your children to church. If you send your children to church with grandmother, by the time they're old enough, only six of them will stay in the church out of 100. Only six. Only six. Thank you, grandmothers, for bringing your children to come because some of them six will be missionaries, ministers, pastors. Thank you for bringing them. But I'm just giving you a reality check, only six. If nobody comes to church but mom and mom brings the kids, 15 will stay. When they get old enough, 15 will stay in church. 85 will leave. Dad, if you're the only one that comes to church and mom stays home and you bring your children, 50 out of 100 will stay. More than three times. Why? I don't know. It's like that man that told me, 70 some years old, and led him to the Lord. What a miracle. But he said, I guess a man should do what his dad does. You may be here today, dad, mom, both together. We need to set some priorities. We need, we, we need to follow God with our whole heart. We don't just want to give him lip service and come in and sing and worship, but we want to follow him with our whole heart. We need to set some priorities. If you need Jesus in your life, if you say, I want to surrender my life to Christ, or if you need to set priorities, you need some things changed, I want you to come to this side. and Somebody will come pray with you. Somebody will pray with you. When I have everybody come, that's your side right over here. Parents, grandparents, who are praying for your children and grandchildren, you say, we have been on our knees. We've been praying for our children and our grandchildren. I want you around here, all the way around. Amen. Come on. Come on, right now. 
right now. Glory to God. If you need to change, you need to set some priorities over on this side. I want to give my heart to Jesus over on this side. Somebody will come to you. Glory to God.